Please take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. We are studying the things that the Apostle John was shown in a series of visions by Yeshua. Now, why are we studying the book of Revolution? A revelation. <laughs> well, for one thing, it's the only book in the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read and hear the prophetic words of this book and obey them. That's in chapter 1, verse 3. Also, Yeshua tells John in chapter 4, verse 1, that he is showing John things which must be hereafter, referring to future events that will suddenly come to pass someday. Not only so we'll know what's going to happen, but also to reaffirm our faith if and when we see these things come to pass in our lifetime. Now let's quickly review the main points that we have learned so far. After studying the letters to the seven congregations in chapters 2 and 3, we covered Yeshua's opening of the seven seals on a scroll in heaven and the calamities which followed on the earth. And those calamities lead into the seven trumpet judgments. In our last two lessons, we studied the first six trumpet judgments. We won't come to the seventh one for a while. Let's remember that in the book of Revelation, whenever we find a group of seven judgments, there is a parenthesis or a parenthetical passage, like an interlude, between the sixth and the seventh, where John changes the subject and discusses something else and then later he comes back and deals with number seven and as I have said before some say that all these events are parallel with each other happening at the same time while others say they are all sequential happening one after the other and we know that the first six seals had to be opened before the wrath of the Lamb was even announced. And the trumpet judgments are not carried out until after all seven of the seals are opened. They start after the opening of the seventh seal, which represents or leads into the trumpet judgments. And those judgments that come with the trumpets are worse than the judgments that were associated with the opening of the seals. And then the judgments that come later with the vials or bowls in chapter 16 will be even worse. But whichever interpretation is correct, whether they are simultaneous or sequential, be assured that they are real. They will literally occur. The trumpet judgments begin in chapter 8 verse 7, which says that hail and fire mingled with blood were cast upon the earth and burned up a third of the trees and all of the green grass. The vegetation is just devastated. And I think a good case can be made for the instrument of God's judgment and destruction being a comet with flaming balls of fire raining down. Scientific discoveries within the last 50 years have shown that every one of the catastrophes of both the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments could be caused by a comet. And if you want to read more about how God could use comets, I suggest a book by Dr. Jeffrey Goodman entitled The Comets of God. But what's important is that however God does it, we need to realize that it is Yahweh, the God of Israel, who brings judgment. It is not nature taking its course. Now, our God can use whatever method he chooses to bring that judgment. But the people on earth will know that these events are from him and that they're not just natural disasters. Then verses 8 and 9 tell us that after the second trumpet is sounded, something, as it were, a mountain, in other words, like a great mountain or as large as one, crashes into the sea and causes unbelievable destruction. A third of the sea turns to blood, which may be an idiom for death. And a third of the creatures in the sea dies. And a third of the ships is destroyed. And again, this could be caused by something like a comet or an asteroid landing in the sea, causing tsunamis and tidal waves big enough to damage even large ships. 
And then verses 10 and 11 tell us that after the third trumpet was sounded, a great star fell from heaven. This time contaminating a third of the earth's fresh waters in the rivers and springs and fountains. And again, this could be a comet falling from the sky, causing contamination by releasing poisonous chemicals that can be formed when the toxic gases of a comet are combined with water and other substances in the condition of extreme heat. And then we see in verse 12 that after the fourth trumpet, a third of the light from the sun, moon, and stars was blocked, perhaps by partial eclipses or by the the smoke and ash and debris that would be thrown up into the atmosphere by the impact of a comet or an asteroid darkening the sky. And the last verse of chapter 8, verse 13, introduces trumpets 5, 6, and 7. And the angel says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And for this reason, they are known as the three woes. Now we studied chapter 9 last week in some detail. But I want to take another deeper look at it today and try to resolve at least some of the unsolved mysteries. And I think at the end of the day we can feel more confident about what or who these mysterious locusts are and also the identity of this star that falls from heaven in verse 1. Now, as I said last week, this star is also called him. And he is given the key to a bottomless pit. So this seems to be a person of some kind rather than a, a, a star or a comet or an asteroid. You know, angels are sometimes called stars in scripture. So this certainly could be an angel. And some of us have assumed that this is a fallen angel, a bad guy. But it could be one of the good angels descending from heaven to open the pit to release more judgments on God's behalf. Last week I said we just can't be sure, but we're going to come back to this guy later today and discuss him some more and look harder and dig deeper. And I think we'll have a better idea about who he is. Remember that this bottomless pit is not just a place of punishment, but it's also a place of incarceration. The Greek for bottomless pit is abuso, a word that is used in the Bible to describe the place where disobedient spirits are kept in prison. Verse 3 says that powerful locusts come out of this pit. These aren't regular locusts. Verses 4 through 6 tell us that they aren't allowed to harm any grass or trees or any green thing, meaning any vegetation. But they will attack people who don't have the seal of God in their foreheads, perhaps referring to the 144,000 in chapter 7. Tormenting them for five months with something so incredibly painful that people are going to want to die, but they won't be able to. And according to verse 10, these supernatural locusts will sting like scorpions, which is the most painful of all stings. And verse 11 says that these locusts have a king over them who is the angel of the bottomless pit. His Hebrew name, Abaddon, means destruction. His Greek name, Apollyon, means destroyer. I want to spend a little more time on this guy today. But first, the locusts. After last week's lesson, I heard at least one comment. I just can't figure out who or what those locusts are. Last week we discussed some possible interpretations of just what these mysterious locusts in Revelation 9 uh, might be. And one idea that I shared with you is that they are actually fallen angels who were imprisoned, who have been locked away for nearly 5,000 years, but who will finally be released from this bottomless pit or abyss. And the sources for that idea, as I mentioned last Sabbath, 
are the Bible and some other Jewish writings. So before we move on into chapter 10 next week, I want to explore and dig into this idea a little bit more from Scripture because that's what counts. So let's back up a little bit and look at this again using mostly the Bible this time. And we're going to find out along the way that I believe several questions will be answered. First, some background. Many people believe that Satan is a fallen angel. And here is why. First, in a prophecy that was given to the prophet Ezekiel, whom Yahweh sometimes called son of man, God refers first to the king of Tyre in Babylon, but very quickly it will be evident that he is also referring to our adversary, Hasatan. In Ezekiel 28, the Bible says, beginning in verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, You seal up the sum, or you're the seal of perfection, in other words, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You have been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of your tabrets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. You are the anointed cherub, or cherub, if you want to say it the Hebrew way, cherub, that covers, and I have set you so. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You have walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created till iniquity was found in you. By the multitude of your merchandise, which means the abundance of your trade, they have filled the midst of you with violence and you have sinned. Therefore, I will cast you as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground. I will lay you before kings that they might behold you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your traffic or trading. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of you. It shall devour you, and I will bring you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold you. All they that know you among the people shall be astonished at you. You shall be a terror, and never shall you be anymore. Now the prophet Isaiah tells us a little more about this cherub, or cherub, this anointed angel that sinned. In Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. He just got too big for his britches, didn't he? Satan was cast out of heaven because of pride. He wanted to be God instead of being a servant of God. It's believed that he was the highest of all the angels. And that wasn't enough. He wanted to take God's place and rule the universe. And because of his rebellion, Yahweh cast him out of heaven. Yeshua confirms that Satan fell from heaven in Luke 10 verse 18 where he says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. But God didn't just cast out Satan. Other angels were cast out with him. Now remember that angels are sometimes called stars in the Bible. Revelation chapter 12, 
verses 3 and the first part of verse 4 tell us that a great red dragon drew one-third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. This means that when Satan was cast out of heaven, one-third of the angels in heaven rebelled with him and were also cast out. Now, just in case you're not sure, how, how do we know that this dragon in this verse is Satan? And how do we know that these stars are angels? Well, John tells us just a few verses later in verse 9. He says, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Pretty clear. These angels became sinful under Satan's influence and were cast out of heaven with him. Now this happened long ago before Yeshua was born. Way back in the time of the book of Genesis, even before the flood of Noah. Now Peter tells us a little more about the imprisonment of these angels in 2 Peter chapter 2 in verses 4 and 5. He says, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So follow this now. This is going to be, a, I think, an amazing insight for some of us. It was for me. And some questions are going to be answered, but you'll have to stay with me. Not only were these angels cast out of heaven to the earth, but these angels, at least some of them, were also cast down to hell into chains of darkness before the flood to wait for judgment. Now, hell in this verse is not the lake of fire, which is the final destination for the devil and his angels and all the wicked, unsaved sinners. The word hell in this verse is the Greek word tartarosas or tar tartarus. It comes from the Greek word, the root word tartaroo. And it means the deepest abscess or abs abscess. Deepest abyss. <laughs> I'll get it right in a minute. The deepest abyss in Hades, not the lake of fire. It seems to be a synonym for abuso, the bottomless pit, the abyss, which again is not just a place of punishment, but one of incarceration where disobedient spirits are kept in prison. Okay, so they were cast out of heaven, and then they, at least some of them, were cast down into the pit, right? Why? You might wonder why these angels were cast down into the bottomless pit. They had already been punished, hadn't they, by being cast out of heaven? But then they're punished even further by being sent to prison in the abyss. Why? We can learn a little more about these angels and what they did to get into this bottomless pit in the book of Jude. Verses 6 and 7 tell us, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own inhabitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So these angels, first they sinned by rebelling against God in heaven, which resulted in them being cast out of heaven, along with their leader, Satan. But then they committed the sins of fornication and going after strange flesh. Now you might wonder, who did these fallen angels fornicate with? And you might wonder what this phrase, strange flesh, means. Well, let me give you a clue. If you're a fallen angel, the flesh or the body of a human is strange flesh to you. Angels are not supposed to have sexual relations with humans. 
but it sure does seem like that's exactly what happened. And in two different ways. Before I show you, let me establish another name for angels that's used in the Bible. Sometimes the Bible calls angels sons of God. For example, in Job 38, God is showing Job his ignorance of God's ways as he discusses the creation of the world in verses 4 through 6. He talks about, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he goes on, who laid the measures? Who stretched out the line? Um, jo Job, who, where were you when I did all that, in other words? And in verse 7, God says that at that time, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of gods shouted for joy. That's not two groups of people. That's a Hebrew parallel statement showing us that the morning stars, which are also called the sons of God, were singing together and shouting for joy at God's creation. Now, let's see what some of these sons of God did just before the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And Yahweh said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants, the Hebrew is Nephilim, in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. That's talking about those giants, those Nephilim. So these sons of God in Genesis 6 are just like the ones in Job 38. They're angels. Except that the ones in Genesis 6 had already been cast out of heaven. The ancient books of First Enoch and Jubilees, which were held in high esteem in the first century, they also speak of angels, holy watchers, they call them, who were lusting after women and taking them as wives and having sons that were called Nephilim, giants that were half angel and half human. And these books go on to say that God was so angry at these rebellious angels that he had sent to the earth that now he decreed they would be locked up underneath the earth in a prison until the day of judgment. So, these angels who were first cast out of heaven, then were sent to prison in the, the abyss, the bottomless pit, because of their sexual sins, which were not only against human women. Let's look again at the passage in Jude. It says... Even as Sodom and Gomorrah. And in that story in Genesis 19, we read that two angels went to the city of Sodom and to the house of Abraham's nephew Lot. And that the homosexual men of the city came to his house wanting to have relations with these angels who appeared as men. So these angels in Genesis were not only fornicating with human women, which resulted in babies that became detestable giants, they were also committing sins with human men, sex, homosexual sins. They were really perverse. And God had enough. He sent them to the pit and decided to flood the earth to wash it of all this contamination. These fallen angels are there in that bottomless pit right now. These sons of God, these stars, are the only creatures, the only entities that have ever been sent down into that pit as far as we know from Scripture. 
Although the devils that Yeshua cast out of a man and into a herd of swine in Luke chapter 8 first begged him in verse 31 to not send them into the deep. And it's that same Greek word, abusos. Refers to the bottomless pit. They didn't want to go there. Now these devils that Yeshua cast into the, pi the pigs, the swine, would seem to be demons, not fallen angels. Because scripture never, ever speaks of fallen angels being cast out of people's bodies. The way unclean spirits or demons can. And Yeshua gave his disciples authority over devils or demons, but we never read of him giving that kind of authority over fallen angels. But then in Luke chapter 11 verse 24, Yeshua says that when an unclean spirit or demon leaves a man, it walks through dry places seeking rest. He doesn't say anything about demons going into the bottomless pit. They wander through dry places looking for another host to inhabit. And if a demon finds no rest, it may try to return to the person it was cast out of. Now there's a lesson right there we want to park on for just a moment. If someone is set free from a demon inside them by having it cast out, that person better get right with God by repenting and by coming to faith in Yeshua and then they need to get filled with the Holy Spirit because if he or she doesn't do these things that person will be in danger of experiencing demonic possession or at least oppression again. Now two verses later in verse 26 it says that that person will be worse off than they were before because the returning demon might not come back alone. It says, then he goes, talking about that demon, and takes to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it is extremely important for anyone who gets a demon cast out you don't have to be saved first to get a demon cast out of you, right? You can still be an unsaved, wicked sinner and have a demon cast out of you. But if that happens, then that person needs to repent. He needs to confess faith in Yeshua. And he needs to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he needs to avoid any sin that could open the door for demons to return. Because they will return if there is no obstacle. If the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you, and if you're walking in faithful obedience, and you're filling your mind and your spirit with the truth of God's word, you cannot be possessed by a demon. And if you are ever involved in casting a demon out of someone, don't tell that demon to go into the abyss. Don't tell that demon to go into the bottomless pit. It's locked up right now. No one in the Bible ever sent a demon there. Yeshua never told demons where to go except for that herd of swine in one incident. All you need to do is tell the demon to leave in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. You don't need to tell it where to go. It wouldn't stay there anyway. Satan walks about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And demons wander through dry places looking for rest and a new host, a new human being, which happens to be at least 70% water. And if you are anointing your home to get rid of demons, again, you don't need to tell them where to go. Just command them to leave in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. If you're interested in anointing your home, we have a step-by-step -step guide with complete instructions on how to do that back there in our literature rack if you'd like to have a free copy. Well, I believe that the bottom line is that the locusts that come out of the smoke of the pit are almost certainly associated with the fallen angels that are now imprisoned there. And when these fallen angels are released one day, they will appear as a thick 
swarm of supernatural locusts stinging people and showing their human-like faces and their other features as they begin the five months of painful torment on the wicked who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. You don't want to be among those people, I promise you. Now, if these locusts are fallen angels who were wicked, then why do they only attack people who don't have the seal of God? That's a fair question. I'll come back to that later. But first, let's talk about the angel of the bottomless pit. What else can we find out about him? Well, first, I believe that he is the same person that we're told about in Revelation 9, verse 1, that star who fell from heaven under the earth and was given the key of the bottomless pit. And again, this star would be an angel because angels are sometimes called stars in the Bible. Now, last week I asked if this had to be a fallen angel, a, a bad guy, and I suggested the possibility that it could be a good angel on assignment from God to use the key to the bottomless pit to release more judgments upon the wicked and only on the wicked. Just to be clear, I believe that the true people of God in Yeshua, biblical Israel, who I believe will have already gone through the great tribulation at this point, will not be affected or harmed by the trumpet judgments which are associated with the wrath of God. Faithful, obedient believers are not appointed to wrath. Now, the calamities that follow the opening of the seals are not, in my opinion, part of God's wrath. They're associated with the great tribulation and persecution by Satan and his hierarchy. By the time the trumpet judgments begin, I believe that the people of God will be in a place of safety, either in heaven temporarily or perhaps in a special place of protection on the earth that is referred to as the wilderness. Either way, if we are walking in faithful obedience to the commandments of God, and if we have the testimony of Yeshua, we won't be experiencing and suffering the trumpet judgments or the bowl judgments. Just as the Israelites in Egypt were protected from the plagues before the first exodus, we will be protected from God's wrath before the second or greater exodus back to the Holy Land when all the exiles are gathered together and returned there from all over the world. Well, let's look now at this angel of the bottomless pit who is the king of the locusts, a little more, and see if we can nail down anything about his identity. Perhaps, after all, he is Satan, falling from heaven in some special way. As I said last week, Satan first fell or was cast out of heaven back in Genesis 3. But he still had access to heaven as we see in the book of Job. If this is Satan here in Revelation 9, then perhaps he loses that access to heaven here. Although he is given a key in verse 1 and he is given access to this bottomless pit and evidently some authority over it. And if this is Satan, then he or someone representing him comes out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11 and kills the two witnesses that we will study in a week or so. Two or three weeks probably. Revelation 11 verse 7 says, And when they shall have finished their testimony talking of the two witnesses, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So, if we continue with this tentative identification of this star, this angel, and this king of the locusts being Satan, 
then he is associated with the beast in Revelation 11 that kills the two witnesses, right? And that makes sense. A good angel wouldn't be involved in killing those two witnesses. This person called the beast, who is basically, it's Satan personified, the anti-messiah, the antichrist, He'll also die later in the story, but then he'll come back to life before his final defeat by Yeshua. Okay, stay with me. Ezekiel chapter 31 contains a prophecy about Egypt and someone called the Assyrian that seems to parallel the stories and the events of Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and Genesis 6 that we looked at earlier. I'm going to read you some verses from that chapter. And as I read this passage, see if you can spot connections between Satan or the beast and a tall tree. And see if you can spot connections between other angels and other trees and, and branches that might be the wives taken by the fallen angels in, in Genesis chapter 6. And boughs that might refer to the children of those unions. There's some crazy symbolism going on here. It's fascinating, but we're going to take this chapter in sections as we look for these connections and these parallels. So beginning in, that, in chapter 31 of Ezekiel, in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of Yahweh came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, Whom are you like in your greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field, and his boughs were multiplied, and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs, and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young, and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus was he fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like him, un, like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So we see here that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God, I see a reference to the time before the flood. This Assyrian king is a very tall tree with many long branches and thick boughs or foliage. This could be an allusion to the beast, who was the king of time, you might say, before the flood and the leader of these sons of God, these fallen angels who mingled with human women and produced giants. It says that other trees, perhaps referring to other fallen angels, envied him. Maybe each one of these other trees is a fallen angel who each took a wife and had giant children, all dwelling under the shadow of the Assyrian. Let's continue now in Ezekiel chapter 31 and verse 10. Therefore, thus says the Lord Yahweh, because you have lifted up yourself in height, and he has shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him. Upon the mountains and in all the valleys his branches are fallen. And his boughs are broken off by all the rivers of the land, and all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. 
Now, well, the, this passage applies first and initially to the Egyptians. It may also refer to the fall of Satan and to God imprisoning the other fallen angels before bringing the great flood. Let's continue now in verse 13. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heaven remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches. That, that might refer to birds and animals clinging to his branches during the flood. Verse 14 says, To the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all the drink water. And now get this, for they are all delivered unto death to the nether or lowest parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. This sure does sound like the fallen angels being imprisoned in the bottomless pit for what they did with the women in Genesis chapter 6. Verse 15 says, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, In the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed. And I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. So this verse is saying that on the day when the Assyrian, which represents Satan in, in this line of thinking, on that day when this Assyrian king, Satan, went down into the pit, on that day God restrained the floodwaters and stayed them. And we continue now in verse 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. This word, nations, right here. The Hebrew is goy, Strong's number 1471. An alternate definition for this word is, are you ready? A flight of locusts. Could Revelation 9 be referring back to this passage? This verse in Ezekiel could be saying that the locusts, the fallen angels, shook at the sound of, of the fall of the Assyrian when God cast him down to hell with them, the fallen angels who descend into the pit. It kind of seems to be about the fallen angels being imprisoned at the end of the flood when God restrains the floodwaters. Now, look at verse 16 and focus on the words that are in bold print that says, And all the trees of Eden shall be comforted in the nether or lowest parts of the earth. And remember that in this understanding, trees symbolize the angels. The root word for comforted here, nakam, Strong's number 5162 can also mean, I get this, it can also mean to be sorry, to repent. Last week I said that when Yeshua died without sin, he took possession of the key to the bottomless pit and went down to hell, to Hades, which is not the lake of fire. And this is based in part on Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. It says, well, I'll just read the bold part. It says, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And this is also referenced in 1 Peter verse, or chapter 3, where we learn why Yeshua descended into the lower parts of the earth. 
in 1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 18. It says, For Christ also has suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Haven't many of us wondered exactly what that was about? Well, I have an idea for you. Now the word sometime in verse 20 is pote, which means formerly, at some point of time in the past. So it implies that the spirits they were disobedient, but they no longer are disobedient. And you got to wonder, what was the point of Yeshua going down there and preaching to them if they couldn't repent and be forgiven? Why would he do it? Perhaps some of those fallen angels did repent. Perhaps they received forgiveness. Now this brings us back to Revelation chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. And the locusts. If these locusts are fallen angels, then whose side are they on? Well, if they've repented, and if they're finally being set free, then they're on God's side. They are given power to attack only the people who haven't repented and the people who don't have the seal of God on their foreheads. Why would bad guys attack bad guys? The kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Most of these people who are attacked will probably have already taken the mark of the beast by that time. They're probably already worshiping the dragon, Satan, and the beast. So these former fallen angels after repenting and after being pardoned, seem to be working for Yahweh now, punishing his enemies. And the angel of the bottomless pit, Abaddon or Apollyon, the destroyer, the beast, he is no longer their king. He may come out of the pit along with them, but they're not necessarily on the same side or working together anymore. These locusts, these former fallen angels now seem to be working for the God of Israel. Now the beast is going to be given power by Satan. And the world is going to follow him. The world's going to worship Satan and his anti-Messiah, the beast. But the beast and the false prophet are going to be thrown into the lake of fire someday. And this will happen right after Yeshua returns just before Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. Notice this. Nowhere is it said that the locusts are cast into the lake of fire after tormenting those who have rejected God. Yet in Matthew 25, 41, Yeshua says that the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. So this evidently will not include the fallen angels who are described as locusts because apparently they have repented and been forgiven and they have rejoined Yahweh's task force. Well, if that's right, what, what becomes of these fallen angels who repented? The first part of Isaiah chapter 14 describes how things will be when Yeshua returns and defeats his enemies and regathers the exiles of Israel along with their former Gentile companions that have joined them. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 14 of Isaiah, the Bible says, For Yahweh will have mercy on Jacob, yet will choose Israel, and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of Yahweh for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were. And they shall rule over their oppressors. 
And it shall come to pass in the day that Yahweh shall give you rest from your sorrow and from your fear and from the hard bondage in which you were made to serve, that you shall take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How has the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. Yahweh has broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hinders. And the, the next two verses just may reveal something about those angels. Remember how in Ezekiel 31 the angels were described as trees? Isaiah 14, 7, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Verse 8, yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, since thou art laid down, no feller or woodsman is come up against us. So while Satan is bound for 1,000 years, the fir trees rejoice. And the cedars of Lebanon say that no woodsman has come up against them to cut them down. These trees are all rejoicing that Satan has been imprisoned. And if these trees, if these trees are the fallen angels of Genesis 6, who are described as the cedars of Lebanon in Ezekiel 31, and if they are the same creatures who come out of the pit as locusts in Revelation 9, as I think they are, then they will still be free during Yeshua's 1,000 year reign, rejoicing with the people of God and all the other angels at Yeshua's victory over Satan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.